So now we have to be careful what we say. <laughs> yes. Okay, so, okay, great. Fantastic. So, we are very pleased today to have Eric Bershaw from Berlin University. Uh, he is a world leading expert in uh, string theory, graphic holography, but today he's going to talk about this very specific topic about non relativistic gravity in the fractional quantum aspects. So, yeah. thank you very much. Okay, well, it's a pleasure for me to be here in Dublin and here at this uh, Diaz Institute. As uh, John was saying, uh, I will talk. So it's I will not so much talk about dramatic new results in three-dimensional gravity or the fractional quantum law effect, but I will talk about work in fact is in progress together with John and Andrea Campoglioni from Mons and uh, Patricio Salgado Ribeiro from uh, Roslav, and it's more about uh, I will talk about the connection between the, between the two fields. So I will try to connect certain uh, things in three-dimensional gravity with the fractional quantum law effect. I think this, this connection. Which is uh, which I, I like about this uh, project. So, um, uh, yeah. so let me first uh, uh, just as a warm up uh, remind you that the fractional quantum Hall effect uh, is a uh, very funny effect that if you have a magnetic field, say perpendicular on gas holes, that is a movement plane, and then uh, it is a current, then you get a voltage. It's a predictive current, and uh, if you measure that to the ductors, then it turns out that people found it with uh, 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 quantized uh, 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 integer quantization by increasing my AT and later a, 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 a fractional quantization. And uh, the fun thing is to explain that we need to move the fact that these electrons they move in a limited way in two dimensions, so you get cut off. You have to use all kinds of tricks about the, the quantum properties and, and topological aspects to explain these things. But uh, so that makes this fractional quantum Hall effect a very interesting model. And um, uh, so uh, the interesting thing is that you really have to use all the tricks of quantum field theory, you have to use topology, geometry, uh, many, many tricks you have to use. And, but I want uh, so th this this quantization is really based on, on topology, and I will not talk so much about that in this talk. But what I will talk about is that it turns out people realize that this fractional quantum Hall effect can also have a non-topological collective excitation. So on top of this uh, topology, you can also have extra collective excitations, and it is in these extra non-topological collective excitations that these massive modes occur. Because uh, in effect, uh, there is uh, the base mode is. Master spin two mode, and that was already found in the eighties by Berger, McDonald, and Platzmann, and then that was also based on a certain symmetry algebra. And later, it was also realized that uh, that that same algebra also should give rise on to high spin modes beyond spin two. And certain numerical calculations were done, for instance, by Goldkar and Gary Bose and so on. And it is about these these massive modes of spin two and higher two that I will uh, talk about today. Now. Because this is a topic, a uh, spin two and high spins, which also occurs in the quantum field theory. So that's where the connection is. Now, often uh, to explain something, you, you, you want to use symmetries. And it's, it, the, that's already interesting that both in quantum field theory and in the fraction quantum Hall effect, the relevant symmetry are the so called area conserving dysmorphisms, which, which have occurred in both fields in a different connection. So, for instance, uh, these area conserving dysmorphisms, I myself got to deal with it. When many years ago uh, we, we uh, introduced a, a membrane as an alternative string, and in, 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 in contrast with string theory, if you quantize and if you put a membrane, if you fix the lifetime gains, then you cannot fix all the symmetries. It's, it's not that you cannot reduce it to a free model. And the, the, the symmetries you are left with are the area conserving dysmorphisms of, of this membrane. And, and, and people thought that you have to use these symmetries then to, to, uh, to, to, get to, know, to get to know things about the spectrum of the membrane. But these area preserving divorces, they depend on the topology. So the, the simplest case people consider in these, these, these days were a uh, torus, and you get this infinite, so m is here, two mesh vector, two directions of the torus, and you get something that this, this effect, because area preserving divorces already occurred in book Arnold in, in, in fluid dynamics, and this, this connection with the membrane was realized in Hopkins thesis and later also by these people. And then, when people investigated the, the spectrum of the membrane, there also was some fascination with this area preserving influence of the two sphere, because that has the interesting property that you can write as the limit of a five dimensional real algebra 
and then people hoped that they would use it as a kind of regularization uh, to calculate the spectrum of the membrane. So if you would calculate for edge of n, and then you take n to infinity, because to immediately deal with this integral is ultimately difficult. And uh, this was in particular done when people wanted to uh, introduce, the, when people introduced the, the supersymmetric membrane in the 80s, and then these people calculated the spectrum and they made use of this fact. But the, the, the symmetry algebra is real, real, this talk is not so much these two things because they don't, they don't contain really a an, an, an kind of, uh, they all contain a finite dimension subalgebra in, in the of 2. This guy, if you take the area preserved in the deforms of the cylinder, is even bigger because it contains as a subalgebra the whole Vizio algebra. And then people got excited because that is the strict theory and you could also uh, uh, extend it to the central extension. So that was then the algebra which will be relevant for this talk. And uh, in my field, what uh, this algebra in fact got extended to what's called the capital W algebra, because what people were trying to do these days is that they knew that the Vierzor algebra, that's as to the string theory, and but they also knew that in conformal field theory they also use a uh, higher spin extensions of the Vierzor algebra. For instance, you can add a spin through, spin three on top of the Vierzor generator, and that's called W3. But that's a non-linear algebra. But people have thought, well, maybe W3 you can also use to, to construct new strings, they call it W strings. But then people realize that if you could take a little bit of empty infinity, that all these non-linearities could be uh, taken care of, they would disappear. And then you get an algebra, which is called the, 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 the W infinity algebra. And that has the property that it also allows central extensions of all high spin generators. Uh, to find non trivial representation, you need central extensions for all the high spins. This not only allows a central extension of the spin too, but it's for all the high spins. And this is the algebra which is relevant to this talk. And all these properties of W algebras are defined in this paper. This extension for small W infinity to capital W infinity, where you add all these extra extensions, was found in this paper. And I should stress that in these days also other infinite dimensional algebras occur, and they are sometimes mentioned in this context of this talk, but they are really, I think, less relevant. And let me just mention them that around the same time, there was also a, a work where people try to uh, construct a three dimensions a gate field of an infinite dimensional high spin algebra called HS11. And that, then you get a, a kind of action three dimensions that describes the infinite number of masses high spins. But that really, that algebra is a kind of non euclidean version of this algebra. So instead of as you n, n, you get a kind of as you n, n. It's the area preserved in the affordance of the hyperbolic space. So that's not really what we are doing here. And then another algebra is that people found that if you take this gate theory and describe its high spins, then if you do uh, if you look to the asymptotic symmetries at infinity of that, that system, then you get an other uh, algebra, and that is turns out to be a, a nonlinear extension of infinity. That became very popular around 2010. That is unfortunately also called double infinity, but it is a nonlinear version. The one I will talk about today is really only this one. The, 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 the linear double infinity is an extension of this uh, area preserved in different models of the cylinder. Because if you now go to the fractional community, uh, the fractional community, uh, sorry. So, okay, can I, can I uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, because, of course. Uh, in the first one, in the Tarsk case, you have a central extension. And yeah. We know the central extension plays a crucial role in the, in the circle one. Not all of these have central extensions. Uh, but some of them do. So here, here, this, every, here, um, every spin 3, spin 4 has a central extension. So this but one the, has a spin, central extension. Yeah, but, but it all works if you, if you, because you see this one is very simple. That's just uh, spin 3, spin 3, you spin 6 or so, and then it stops. But this one is really, you get spin 6 plus h bar spin 4 plus h squared spin 2 plus h central extension. So you really have to extend, it's a very long-term extension to go from here to here. That was found by these people by just doing the calculation. Uh, sorry, by, by these people. And then you can get an extra and central extension for every generator. Only, only in that case. You get a central extension for every generator. Yeah, yeah. Okay. For spin 3, spin 4, is that and spin 4. Although I spent that also not to the representations of these high spins. Is that a global way of representing that central extension? Global, well, um, this was really a is kind it of. Uh, 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 I mean, it must be related to some anomaly. Yeah, yeah, it is related to the light of the central extension. Yeah. It's all okay. That would just relate to the conformal anomaly. Yeah, yeah. So is there, is it, I mean, the, you're in odd dimensions and there's no conformal anomaly, there's no trace anomaly. So, what, well, what anomaly is there? So, what, that's what people try to do here, right? They, they, they have these double three, etc. But they try to construct double three strings. They try to write down world sheets which has this extra double three symmetry, and then they really require that they have the cancellation of all norms. That was an effort to construct double strings, but that's not really what I'm doing here. 
difference. I'm really only talking about an algebra that arises at the point I want to make, and that's a remarkable thing, that exactly this algebra also arises from a rather different context in the fraction of the normal fact. That's the point I want to make. Uh, yeah, no, I think that. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, and it is remarkable because uh, in the so in the fraction quantum whole fact, people also talk about area preserving diffeomorphisms, and uh, then for instance, they, they, it, it's, it's like this: and you have like a circular droplet, and then you deform it, and then you keep uh, the preserved area, and then you get all kinds of of modes. And in some sense, these modes you can uh, they, you can organize also somehow in in in, in, in high. In, Modes describing spin two, spin three, spin four. So this is really uh, uh, this you can associate these different modes with a small double infinity algebra, which then at the quantum level also becomes the double infinity algebra. But in fact, called the non fact that was not called the double infinity, it was called the GMP algebra. And this connection that the GMP algebra of the fraction called non fact is the same as the double infinity algebra is uh, propagated by uh, Capelli in particular. And it is really remarkable because. As far as I know, when people in the quantum field theory literature give the W infinity algebra, they give a horrible algebra, where right? they give all the structure constants with E, B, C, et cetera. It's, it, but as, this GMP algebra is a close algebra. They derive some sign, and, and it's just one expression. So somehow, uh, uh, I have not studied the literature enough, but somehow Capelli must have shown that the two are the same, but that's, for me, a non-trivial answer, uh, a non-trivial result. But that's the connection. This GMP, and this GMP algebra was used by these people also to predict not only this spin two massive mode, but also the higher spin massive mode. So it's really also kind of high spin algebra. So, um, so here you see a connection, but what I will do now is so I will not mention symmetries that much uh, from now on, but I will show you how this GMP mode uh, is interpreted uh, in the recent literature uh, in the fraction of the whole effect, and that I, will, I will show you then that the way that is done is very similar as it is done in quantum field theory. I will make a connection. So that's what I want to do now. So this was the introduction. So, um, so that's the aim of this talk. I want to make a connection between these mass of high spin modes in fraction of the mole effect, all these different uh, fluctuations, area preserving fluctuations, and three dimensional relativistic mass of high spin theory quantum field theory. I want to make it more concrete. And the connection is I will take a, a, a cleverly chosen limit of the relativistic case and see that you get exactly these mass of high spin modes in the fraction of the mole effect. That, that's, uh, that, that's the connection I would like to, uh, to uh, explain. So what I will do is first I will discuss the mass of spin, the original GMP modes. And I will, uh, so the way people look at it these days is that they associate it with a symmetry break. They associate it with the so-called nematic phase. So the, the quantum whole fluid can have an isotopic phase. But also, and I will explain it in a minute, a nematic phase, and that transition from isotopic to nematic is described by a, a certain order parameter which you can associate with this mass of spin 2 modes. And then I will discuss the same mass of spin 2 modes in quantum field theory and make the connection. You see that you really get the same, uh, the same thing and the same uh, equation, equations of motions. And once I've done it, I will uh, show you how there's a natural generalization to mass of higher spin modes. And having done that, then uh, I will uh, have a kind of gel. It depends a bit on how much, how much time I have. I would like to discuss, uh, because you see, I myself worked in three dimensions on so called three dimensional mass of gravity. So that's also mass of mode relative physically. And we did many things or many uh, things. And each time, once you have this connection, you think about what does it imply for the description of the mass of modes in fraction of mold. And things like curve background, like boundary terms, like supersymmetry. And I would like to go over a few of the options where, where you could learn from one field to get to know something about the other field. That's what I would like to do. But that depends a bit how much time uh, we will be uh, left with. So first, the mass of spin two modes from nematicity in the fraction quantum whole effect. So a nematic order is uh, that's something that uh, that is that you see if you have an isotopic phase, then let's say if these are kind of, this is by the concept this was. Uh, also studied uh, in, in the liquid crystal literature, then you have all kinds of directions. There's no preferred direction. And in the nematic phase, everything is uh, in, in this direction or the opposite direction, or more or less in that direction. So in the isotopic phase, there's no preferred direction. It's rotation symmetry, everything. And in a perfect nematic phase, then everything is exactly in the y direction, up or down, both up or down. There's a twofold symmetry. And in the nematic phase, it's not perfect. That they are more or less uh, in that direction. And 
to describe. So they claim now that there is a phase transition that's allowed from the rotational isotropic phase to the metric phase, and for that you need an order parameter. So this is kind of it is not a topological phase transition. It is really to simply plating and make the practical stomp simply plating. So what you would like to have is an order parameter that distinguishes between the isotropic phase and the metric phase. And now you might think that the obvious way to do that is uh, <coughs> that you put into a vector order parameter because you just take the order parameter, which is so you sum over all the molecules and then you uh, you take their position and if uh, and then you, you average it and that's then uh, that's then the order parameter. But then you uh, always get zero because there's every, it's, there's always as many up uh, as many down. There's no preferred up or down. So then you get always zero. So what people do is that instead of that, they introduce an, 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 an order parameter with two of these uh, positions of these L's. So L's are the position of the molecules, uh, and this is a unit vector. And they take it then L A L B, and they subtract something because this subtraction is just a convention that you want that for an isotopic phase that the order parameter is zero. So if you isotopic phase, there's no distinction between x and y, so each of them is a half. That means that this is then, uh, if you take it in x, x over y direction, it's a half, and then this subtracts a half, so you get zero. And if you take now, uh, let's say that you take a perfect pneumatic phase in the, in the y direction, then you see Lx is always zero, then, then you get in the Lx, Lx, you get minus one half, but in the Ly, Ly, and this is one, and then the zero, you get plus one half. So, then you get, so you can clearly see that this is an object which can distinguish between the isotopic phase and the perfect pneumatic phase is uh, zero here, and it is this here. And if you have partial ordering, so a non-perfect thing, then you parameterize the position of these things uh, into an, an angle theta, and you have to average over them. And what happens then is that for every entry, you have to average over these thetas, but you get always the same Legendre polynomial, which you can pull out. So if you do that calculation, you calculate each time the average, you can always bring them in this form of this Legendre polynomial, get, then you get a Q, which is the strength, and you get this matrix. And this is if you have an, uh, if the direction is in the y direction. But if you want to have it in the r to direction d, there's a little trick. You write this thing as the sum difference of two matrices. And this is a chronic delta. And this is exactly the y y direction, which then you replace by an r to vector d. So this kind of trick that you can go from y to r to d. And that's the standard expression that people say that the order parameter describing this phase transition is given by a symmetric traceless vector where Q is the strength of the order parameter and D, that's the, 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 that's the direction, that's the plane in the metric director order. And, uh, and it is traceless by convention because I want Q to be zero in the isotropic phase. So if you deviate a little from isotropic, that's what we will do, that Q is very small. So you see, and, and here you already see, an, an, it smells already a kind of uh, spin two behavior because it's a symmetric traceless uh, tensor. Excuse me, sorry. Can I, yeah. Physically, what is it that's lining up in the market space? So, so say again. Physically, what is it that's lining up in the market space? For this, for that, it is apparently you can see the liquid crystals that that's the direction of the molecules in this liquid crystal. They are, uh, they they are the isotropic. They are everywhere, always everywhere. But now they are, let's say, if y is here, they they are more or less in that direction. Not quite, but the best. What are the molecules in the market? What? What are the molecules? Well, this is uh, this, uh, this is difficult because you should not these are all collective modes, so it's more abstract. You should not think about a specific molecule. These are all uh, it's more abstract because you really talk about collective modes in fractional protocol. It's not really that you talk about individual molecules. Everything is described by multi-particle uh, things. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's more difficult to, to think about it. It's not related to James Conley's experiment. To what? Are they related to James Conley's experiment or something? Well, you use, of course, common terms to describe these things uh, that, that are in some sort of composite things. Um, uh, I, I can't, I, I, I can't really uh, see. And for me, it's common to see is it that these, these private. Right. Yeah, that's where yeah, I can't yeah. No, maybe you can think that the Landau orbit are straight. You know, you can think that uh, only when you have a, um, a orthogonal magnetic field in the plane, then you have a, a you know circular Landau orbit. Once you deform a little bit like a filter magnetic field, then you stretch the Landau orbit. They they follow in every direction. Oh, it's yeah. associated with filter field? Yes, yeah, so one of the ways ah, you can do one of the ways is to make the But that's the explicit thing. That's for spontaneous. Well, well, yeah. It's explicit, yeah, but um 
I mean, at the end, you, you need an order for me to describe this situation. But I presume that uh, what can happen is that uh, those uh, those morphs, those elliptic morphs, um, can uh, play a role even uh, though the electricity morphs are great because there are fluctuations around that. Yeah, there are fluctuations. Yeah, the, uh, oh, yeah. It's an energy one. Yeah, right? so continuously have elliptic morphs even though the field is not filled. You could have. Yeah. His, his area was out to be a morph, so it's probably going to come back to that. We are also yeah. breaking the rotation yeah. suit. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We are going to come back to that. So that's great. That, that's the thing that's broken. That yes, because yeah, I stopped yeah, the rotation, I'm not going to That's how we see two. That's what's broken in the mimetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's exactly as well. So this yeah. is only relevant in the fractal quantum model effect. That is. This is only for the fractal quantum model effect. Only for the fractal quantum model effect. Only for the fractal quantum model effect. So, uh, so we, we want to use this order parameter to describe the phase transition, and so, um, but I want to describe only uh, this, the, the quantum effect close to the isotopic phase. So I assume Q is very small eh, because I took Q is zero for the isotopic phase. So I can now expand. Usually, then people expand the free energy. So these are then fluctuations around the isotopic phase, and then you can get an effective Lagrangian, and then we also add an. Uh, uh, so this can. Uh, uh, high, high order, and this is F of N in space unit, if, if, if the order counter also in terms of space, and this is to add also because but, but this is a potential thing to add uh, this, this is based on the, the, the time because we know that it's not a time because so we don't take it zero squared. And then you have to build up what's called an Ivana Bouchet effective fit theory, which you describe the situation close to the isotopic phase. The idea is now if you want to disintegrate it. Is that how it also due to four terms? Is that uh, if you go that this is a potential, and if you go that it's minimum to potential, it's simply breaking. But the only thing is that only works if Q is larger, so you get, let's say, deep in the, in the limit phase to get this, and then you can also go so much and stuff. And then <coughs> this whole description becomes a bit shaky because the machine Q is small. So on one side, it's used to describe simply breaking. But if you really want to know more details, you have to use uh, also an alternative microscopic description. And I, want, I don't want to look out, stay close to the of phase, and I just want to describe now the, the mode that this effective production describes. So I, I stay away from, uh, from two large values of, of Q. <coughs> and that is a kind of, well, the, the, the phenology, and you adapt the parameters, you, just, uh, you, 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 you scale on K2, you three, but I just do model this uh, in this, this mode. And if you have this effective Lagrangian, then uh, then you have an, uh, your master spin to TFP mode. And the way it goes is that this, Q, this special thing about three, so this only thing that works in three dimensions, three, by, by three, I mean two space and all time, because A is then the two dimensional space, and then you can write any symmetric traces matrix in terms of that only two independent components. And these two independent components you can combine in one complex parameter. So Q on one and Q on two are real, but Q is complex. So that is on Q exponential I phi. And, uh, so yeah, this is the order parameter. So and then this this uh, this, uh, this 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 d is the direction is that is cos phi to sine phi to the, the one of the two is to do with the fact that it's a twofold symmetry. And then in terms of this q, you can write the quadratic part of Lagrangian. Uh, you can write uh, that leads to this homotopy. And this thing describes a uh, gap master spin two mode. Uh, and this is in the space derivative and this is a master, and that's the GMP mode which was introduced by Gervin McDonald plus one, but it's now associated with this uh, phase transition from an isotopic to the pneumatic phase. This uh, is really uh, the fluctuation of this order parameter, and uh, uh, there are many other people who worked on, on this. So that is how you get the, 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 the GMP mode in the fraction quantum all effect. Uh, uh, describing a, a, a phase transition. And what I would like to do now is to get the same thing. So we see that the relevant thing is a QAP. I want to do the same thing now uh, in quantum field theory and get it, see how, how we get a similar answer. So uh, can we see uh, how you're, uh, why there's an asymmetry if I wrote in terms of Q? So, 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 yeah. Can I see how the axis in the symmetry would be broken in your effect? Well, yes, because you get an. Uh, uh, it's like a Mexican head potential. Eh? You 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 get. I have to make a value for the Q. The, yes, so I, yes. I didn't I didn't write the Q before. Right there, yeah. but it's literally like a Mexican head potential that you have to fix for Q. But the Q is of course not close to zero. Yes. So you you're going to put in a potential for Q. For yeah. The yeah. But that won't break the rotational invariance. 
Wel, dat wil breken de. Uh, ja, het, is de, 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 de het is allemaal de Q. Het depends on the, the Q will be fixed. The size will be fixed. The size will be fixed. The, 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 the other thing drops out because that actually is rotationally variant. Eh? That 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 uh, that. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, but that's the symmetry breaking. Uh, you will have more stuff on the So, 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 so in the Q and P, has the size Q and X. And what then will drop out because it is rotationally variant. So you only get Q squared to the form is that uh, you would then that goes Q. You would have goals on odds for Yeah, but then yeah, then the goals on odds, but that is uh, mm -hmm. that that I don't see here. I don't because it, my whole thing is not good enough to describe all these things. Because I assume that Q is very small because I did an expansion. So uh, that yeah, that is there, but then people get nervous. Uh, well, John, you know more about yeah, that. No, yeah, yeah. Mentioning goals and all that, that's deep in the metric phase, and yeah. I have to stay out of it. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. It, it should restore the, uh, the symmetric phase to, to those zero moments. Those well, what will happen is that these massive modes, well, so people master them. Uh, uh, yeah, there appears some massless mode, so we don't not get any massless mode because we are very close to the isotropic phase. So only when you cross this isotropic case, you completely deep pneumatic, as I said. Yeah, yeah, how you can, how you can uh, describe the symmetric phase and, and that? This yeah, is a see how you describe the pneumatic phase. This is a, no, this is a symmetric phase with the pneumatic fluctuation. These are just around the, the, the close to the phase transition. Okay, so just so the you know, around the symmetric phase. Yeah, symmetric yeah, yeah, without plus plus yeah, fluctuation. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, that's yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. I can see that. Yeah. The difficulty was seeing how you were going to get into the pneumatic phase. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> the problem is, I, oh, I have only one defense line around on that matter because I'm an expert. If you break through that one, I have to refer <laughs> to yourself for the second defense line. <laughs> but now we do it from the quantum field theory point of view. So, and then. Sorry, could I just ask a question quickly? Uh, do you know what the order, for, uh, do you know what order your phase transition will be a priori? Sure, who's this? Uh, this is one of my uh, Jasmine, I think, who is asking a question. She's asking, oh, do you know the order of the phase transition? Is it first order, second order, third order, whatever? Well, there's an example where you create to my first defense line. So oh, I. It's a Landau theory, so it's a second order phase transition. Landau theory. Okay. It's, it's a poorly Landau. That's yes. why Landau is it's a Landau. So it's first order and Landau yeah. description. And yeah. then you don't go beyond that. Exactly. Okay. Okay. It's funny that it should be important how we could do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, so now we do it in the quantum field theory. Then to describe a mass spin two part, we use the first power theory. And um, so then we have an, uh, and then we, what we use the basic input is it is not a symmetric two. Uh, QAB was two, uh, two or two, let's use a symmetric three by three matrix, H mu mu. And then this is a kinetic term, it's just a linearization of the isomer term, and this is a mass term. And, uh, and it is symmetric and HT trace. And a few remarks uh, I should make is, uh, uh, yeah, let's see that, uh, first of all, the master, there are only two masters, and so it, 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 there are many more dangers if you do the relativistic case, because the master could introduce ghost in the system, and we really have to fine tune these two terms in order to avoid the occurrence of such ghosts. Um, also, uh, I've introduced here C, and the way I will take the limit is I will take uh, C to infinity, uh, which is basically means uh, non relativistic. Uh, you, of course, you can't take C to infinity, but what you do is really replace C by lambda C, and lambda is then a contraction parameter which you take to zero. So C disappears from the system. There is no C in the, in the GP mode. So I will take the limit in a minute. But clearly, this is uh, problematic because this blows up, this guy, and also all the time that it just disappears. So you can't take naive C to zero. You, of course, you could redefine the mass parameter with the volume of C, but that is not the mass parameter anymore. And I really would like to have a, a mass, a physical mass. So uh, there are some issues, but uh, but let's just go on. This 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 idea describes the mass of spin two particle, and it is varied under translations and noise transformations. In a kind of standard way, where the translations are this parameter a u, and the noise transformation are this lambda mu. So it has these symmetries. And now I want to take a look. So why are you? You don't have a C in the kinetic term. You decided to pull out. Is, is that what? You've decided to pull out C from the mass, but you decided to leave C times T to be the. Uh, no, so so the well, 
uh, dit is een C hier, hè. so every time contraction is one of C's, every time contraction is suppressed by one of C's curves. Oh, I see, it's in the, yes, yeah. you are. Ja, daarom is twee wezen te zien, vindt A, die C, X, 0, is C, 10, or C, I, 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 So, clearly, the time, the time difference will disappear, and, and this will blow up. So, so, that's why it is uh, not, non-trivial to, uh, well, I must say that the time difference will disappear. It's not so bad because after all, uh, that you mentioned I've only La Pache, and that's a plot for the field that is kind of force, like uh, Newton potential, is not La Pache five, it's yes. something beyond yes. cares. But then you see then you lose a particle. I want to take it in such that I preserve a particle. That makes it more difficult. Well, I should be easy. So um, so let's so now what I do is that a little shortcut is that um, um, well, first of all, I, I only look to the, the fields and I look to the transformation rules. Because that's enough to take it. I don't take it in the Lagrange. That's much more work. But it's for my purpose, it's enough to take it in the transformation rule. So, first of all, uh, I know that from the fields power field equations, you can also show it's not only symmetric, but also traceless. And I will use that. Uh, if you don't like that, there is an alternative formulation of the fields power Lagrange where A is traceless from the beginning. And it has to do with what's called unimodular gravity. This is the case here for the preserved deformations. But it looks nice, you think maybe this is already the area preserved amorphous, but at the end of the day, if I take the limit in this way, you get the same answer, so I, I won't do it. But, but that's slightly more elegant because then A is traceless from the beginning. But and now, if I shoot A is traceless, then I can decompose it into a, a time time component, a time a phi, and time space component V, and a symmetric traceless uh, spatial to a two matrix. And, uh, and then I can take, but you see what happens now if you take C to infinity. Then, then uh, the relevant thing to look at is under a boost. What is a boost? A boost is the remnant of a rotation. A rotation is always that if you have two directions and there's a rotation, then one goes to the other and the other goes back. And let, let's say, uh, after all, a boost is a rotation between time and space. So under a Lorentz rotation, time goes to space, space goes to time. But under, um, if you take a limit, then the rotation goes to boost. That means that you still have that space goes to time. But time goes back to space with a suppressed factor of 1 over c squared. So that's if you take c to infinity, it's gone. So a boost is a let's say half a rotation. That means that if you use that, you see that, that the boost always works in one direction. So because phi was a time time component and v a was time space, so the time in this goes to uh, space, but not the other way around. V doesn't go back to phi. So under a boost, the, 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 the directions here are suppressed, so you see that phi goes to v, goes to s goes to zero under boost. Which means that you see, if you have these guys, it needs S. But if you need to take S, then you never see these guys because it never transforms back to these guys. And it just shows that it's sufficient to have S to build up the whole representation. So the whole ones just decode because you see it in the transformation. S doesn't know anymore about phi and V because the boost never can go back. So that's why S is, if you take the limit, all these low ones get washed out, and what's left is the S. And that's why I did for the pneumatic phase transition that is in three dimensions with these two independent components, and you can combine in a complex field, and that is uh, only possible in three dimensions. You should be careful, it looks like it has no indices, you think maybe it's a complex scale, but it's not, because it has indices, spatial indices, and in particular, that means that under the spatial rotation, a scale is only transformed in this way, but since it has these spatial indices, it also has an internal rotation, and that shows it has a spin. So that's, that, 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 that shows that it's S, V, and S, V, too, because it goes under the space rotation. It also rotates internally with an extra. So the lot is just the, the, in, in, in the, 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 the space rotation, and the is in, in, in two dimensions, get back to the So it's really, S is something that describes the, the, the spin two thing. And I have already a complex field. And now, uh, yeah, now there's still an issue, because I'm not there. Because um, if you if you if you if you you see there's something very funny if you go from um, relativistic to non-relativistic is that um, that you see if you look to the, the symmetry fact range goes to Galilei, but Galilei is not good enough. And the reason is that you see uh, what is funny that if relativistically energy is mass is equal to energy and it's conserved. That's one conservation. But non-relativistically, mass is conserved and energy is conserved, and they are two different things. There are two conservation laws. And that means from the symmetry point of view, I need an extra generator to describe that. 
En dat means that somehow dilates is never good enough to describe a massive mode. What you need is a center extension of dilates, it's called the Bartman algebra. And, uh, and so, I, so if I would stop now, I would I really have literally taken the, the, the contraction to the Galilei algebra, but I really want to Bartman, otherwise it will never make a uh, uh, massive mode. And the way to do that is that I have to make one more redefinition, which is a kind of funny. I really, I make use of the fact it only works for complex fields. And but I have since I, I went I combined things in complex fields, I have emerged one symmetry, and then I redefine my S with a phase factor times a new field Q. And the phase factor is something that blows up mc squared minus and into the new constant E0. And the trick is now that if you calculate the transformation of this new field, then it will have an extra boost transformation. And why is that? Because you see in the phase factor is a C squared T. But t under a boost goes to 1 over c squared x. It was suppressed, eh? it was, it, t doesn't go back to x. But since it's a c squared, you see it. Then it, 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 and that's this guy here. So you build it, the, the thing is that it, it, it is in the, so under a boost, you get a standard boost, but with a compensating U1 transformation. That's the extra thing. And then you can show that this symmetry algebra, that really describes a Barton algebra. Because if you now calculate the commentators, that is changed because you have this extra term and it satisfies a, a, a Barton algebra. And that is the standard algebra of the Schrödinger Lagrangian. So if you now, now you have this transformation rule, it satisfies the Barton algebra, and then there's a unique way to, uh, to write down an invariant, which is first order in time derivatives. And that's this guy. That's just the Schrödinger Lagrangian. Well, for a spin to play the Schrödinger Lagrangian. So Q is a spin to field. And uh, you can easily see that you need this compensating uh, uh, G1 because you see under an, under an, uh, under an, uh, under a boost, the, uh, let me see, the, um, uh, yeah, under a boost, the spatial, under a boost, the spatial is going to time. You see, the immediate cancellation to disconnect terms with one time derivative and disconnect terms to spatial derivatives. Under a boost is spatial derivative plus a time derivative. That's nice, because you have your own time derivative. But there is a second spatial derivative. But the nice thing is that that second spatial derivative is actually this x, and that gives you exactly the, that skills. And then you get exactly that the two cancel each other. So this term, what I want to say is this term is really needed to, to give a fine tune to this kind of term so that's a boost effect. If you would not have done that, that showing the function would not be invariant in the boost syntax. And this is now uh, the standard showing the function. And uh, Oh yeah, sorry, I want to say more. And that's exactly, in fact, the thing we ended up in the nematic phase. Here we have now Q. In, one, in that case, Q came from a nematic order parameter, and here Q comes from the remnant of the symmetric tensor. But at the end of the day, you get exactly the same uh, Lagrangian. There's one more thing, because you see, this thing really tells you how Q transforms. So I know from the beginning I had translations, one symmetry, but also discrete symmetries. And you can now nicely see also which discrete symmetries are broken for the GFP mode because you see this phase factor is very dangerous because C blows up. And it's, it's okay because what happens if you calculate the variance of Q, then the phase factor occurs twice and it just drops out. It's, it's you only use it the effect that depends on, on T. But, uh, but it has to drop out and it doesn't drop out if you have a transformation that Q becomes Q star. So, because then you get uh, the two phase factors on cancel, but one has a certain opposite side, and they add up. And that explains that certain discrete symmetries are broken. So, so before you take the limit, then you have a, a parity symmetry, x1 goes to minus x1, time reversal, t goes to minus t, and an inversion. And if you calculate now, using these things, how that is for the S-field, if you calculate now the new field Q transforms at this limit, then you'll see that uh, in... Um, So the P is broken because then uh, you see the S goes to S star. And if you calculate then the S, then you'll see the phase factor just drop out. And then the C squared, it blows up, it's not defined. So that's broken. And the T is also broken because you remember there was a T, that was in the C squared T. So if you, re if you replace T by minus T, then again the phase factor does drop out. So here it doesn't drop out because of the complex conjugation. Here it goes T goes to minus T. So these are broken. And the only thing that's left is the PT and the inversion. So the product of the two is uh, preserved at the end. And that's exactly the, 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 the unbroken symmetries which you also find in the GDP mode. Excuse me. So, why do you say inversion is discrete? Because it's really just a rotation. Yeah. Why do you say inversion is discrete? It's really a rotation with respect to inversions. It's a rotation of trying to. Well, uh, it, yeah, oh, yeah, well, it is, yeah, super. I'm told that inversion symmetry is the basic symmetry of the of the fraction of the non-factor. Rotation is the break, inversion is the break. That's what I'm told. 
Ze zijn aan het stressen dat inversion is not open. Sittel is een sittel. Zo is het subject ook al door de Is het subject? Ja. Maar somehow it is a fundamental symmetry of the fraction from the whole fact we should never be broken. So you break the rotation of the symmetry. Yeah, but the rotation of the symmetry is still symmetry. Yeah, sittel is a fundamental symmetry of the function of the function of the function. But one more thing I want to say is that, uh, remember in the beginning I said that the traceless of the H, that was a subsidiary condition, but I could also have started from a Lagrangian of model graph in which, in which H already in the beginning is traceless. You could ask the same question about parity, because the, uh, my, my model graph theory is event parity, and it's quite fun that if they limit the parity of both. You could also say, why don't you start with a theory which already is in, uh, not event and a parity, and there is such one. And that is namely, instead of fixed power, you can also work with what's called sometimes a square of fixed power. It's, it's a first order uh, Lagrangian, first order derivatives. But uh, you can do that, but then you see, the nice thing about this real fixed power is that I could combine two fields in a complex one. Because I need always a complex thing to get the Schrodinger equation. If you start with fixed power, then uh, it's square of fixed power, it's first order one. You can't do that. And the only thing then to do is that you make fields complex from the beginning, and then you get the same answer. But then it's much harder if you ever want to extend this to interactions, etc. It's not so easy how to make fields suddenly complex. It's much easier than to start from fixed power. So it's an alternative thing at this level to work, but to extend it, I think it's uh, much more difficult. But uh, that, that would be an optional way to get again the Schroeder equation. So the lesson is that, uh, that the landau in description of the fluctuations of the metric order parameter Q, symmetric traces around the isotopic phase, can be recovered from a non deterministic limit of the three dimensional fixed power theory by means of, and that also, by the way, both them contain three parameters. The landau de contained the K1, K2, K3, and we had a gravitational constant in front of the Lagrangian, and the mass, and E0 was this constant I introduced when I refined it. I feel S to the Q. So this really an, uh, that, that's the connection that the two can be obtained in different ways uh, in, in this uh, uh, simple context. That, that's the connection. And what I want to discuss now is uh, how that also has been recently extended to higher spins. Because both in the fraction quantum hall effect, people have done calculations, numerical calculations, suggesting that should be a higher spin analogs of the GMP mode. And in quantum field theory, we work all the time with high spin fields. We like them because we think that has to do with quantum gravity or so, and uh, we, we love higher spins. And I will show you now that, again, you can make this connection. So, and the way it goes in the fraction quantum Hall effect is that, uh, because you not only have a, a, a nematic phase at, at one uh, preferred direction, and uh, the next step uh, is, uh, is again, if you want to uh, preserve the inversion symmetry, is, the, is what is called, and that occurs also in the liquid crystal literature, a tetratic phase, in which you have, so you have two, two, two possible directions, like uh, instead of one, it's, it's now, it's now, so the rotation symmetry will be broken to a C4 instead of a C2. Sorry, just to go back, is there some, is it related to why the, uh Inversion symmetry should always be preserved. Yeah, that is all the time done, Stanley, and I, I, I don't dare to ask why, but, uh, but uh, somehow it, that's a deep belief. Yeah, well, in the. It's in the it looks like it comes No, when uh, we write the last link wave function, they are intrinsically inversion invariant. So there is an answer, you know, there is not a exact solution of many body function of quantum mode, but there is what people believe, and they in particular would have believe that, uh, that inversion is really the crucial. Why, why do they believe that? Because the magnetic field looks like it might break. No, no, no. The magnetic field breaks at time reversal and particle, as uh, Eric said, but uh, does not break in necessary uh, inversion. If, if it's purely transverse, it doesn't break. Which yeah, means yeah. mm -hmm. well, 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 you have to use the little bit, which but you haven't, and then uh, we just that's all we decided. And we do the spontaneous breaking up explicitly. You don't tell the text. <laughs> that's all I suppose you have yeah. to. Yeah, no. no, no. And that's why I skip one step, because also we go from this to three, and that would be that would be allowed if you do not care about the inversion symmetry. But I need to go from this to this four, C four, yeah. and it like in the spin, as I say, so I jump the spin to skip four, I skip the spin three. I mean, in the real situation, yeah. it's almost impossible. Not no, no, no. have the tiniest little bit of misalignment. But the consider this: the, the fraction of quantum only described by Sir Simon theories. Sir Simon theories are inversion invariant. Also, so they break. Uh, so they also, um, so they break time reversal. They break parity, but they keep conversion. 
is usually never uh, is overlooked. <laughs> but, yeah. but it's, it's in the margin side, yeah. visible energy outside. Yeah, so the, the theory is the Chersimo part, that is a topological sector, and it is like only the non topological part, is dynamical geometric sector. Mm, that's but the full theory, the full theory is uh, yes, up, yeah, and no. up, yeah, you add up the two sections. Mm. So everything has to be compatible. And again, if you check that all the Chersimos are always an inversion part. Yeah, yeah, but it's a full thing there. Sorry? It's a full thing there. Yeah, the, well, the, the C2 invariant. Because you have always you have an absolute symbol and a zero on two, so it goes to both one and two chips. So yeah, two both. Yeah, yeah, both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You have that. If you change one, it is. No, one, one does work, but both. One is work, two works. <laughs> so if you have absolute zero on two, if you change one to minus one, it changes the side. If you change one and two both sides, yeah, I, I understand the general side of the fact that there's a problem with that one, uh, that you have to add it to these ones. And that's the part that we worry it is not the boundary. The boundary will be better. That's a nice question. You have to add the boundary term to it. So in the, 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 the real degree is three hundred. Yeah, but that is the kind of both. Yeah, the kind of both, which doesn't look like it. Right? Yeah. Well, no, at least that that's the two in the <laughs> But then you are at the boundary. Yeah, the, the boundary is one plus one. Which of all you you have a boundary and there's a z two from one part to the other. Z two. Yeah, but the boundary is, the, is a one plus one. You don't take it, but, I mean, you have already reflection. Uh, but it should be reflected to the other part of the boundary. We're going to change it to that. We're going to change the antipodes. So if you, have, no, if you have an anomalous, yes, it's better to take not a disk, but an anomalous. No? So, like a, a double, a, a disk inside another. So then they can exchange. Uh, so, so if you have, depends on how many boundaries you have. Right? If you have a single boundary. You have just one boundary. No, but then you can. <laughs> No, uh, that is not. Uh, I mean, it's intrinsic at one plus one, it's single boundary. So the boundary also has a different piece, it's also it's a dynamic. So it's a boundary of the three dimension system, and the inversion that's been done is that is. No, the, the inversion, inversion no. is done the two dimensional system. So the inversion is a bug feature. So inversion, it is, so inversion, it's hard to keep inversion on. Uh, so only if you're on the sphere, you could keep inversion. Right, because uh, what you say, uh, a pole and anti-pole, but uh, we have a disk. And yeah, 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 disk. That's not the not not. Yeah, but when I transfer the three here, I have this uh, curl boson on the circle. Right. I know there's an there's an inversion, but I'm doing it on the transverse. But it's interchanging the boundary elements. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. that uh, usually in general is proper. So in general, boundary terms break in inversion. Yes, that was what we worried about. But again, we here we are talking about uh, let's say compact. Uh, we, this, the, the boundary is another story, so it's an extra. So, so here is a theorem of the bulb. So okay. then one has to add the extra term to include the CFP and the etc. Et okay, so it's, so it's from the bulb to this. It's a bulb fit. It's described by each other. Yeah, it's a yeah, 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 inversion actually. Also, the last point we talked about inversion and bulb is completely bulb. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, if we forget the boundary modes, then yes. Yes, the most, most easy answer. Forget about what we're asking. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's why we have so tetraphic things, and that's and, and that these things you get that we discussed that by tilting the magnetic field, and then well, this I give now shortly. I derive you how to the magnetic phase by a two index tensor, but it turns out that in a tetraphic phase, if you want to do correctly, so a T which is zero for the isotropic phase and then non-zero for this tetraphic phase, you need a four index magnetic traces tensor, and one day you can see that it's not a proof, but at least you should believe that for the moment. Is that, well, first of all, again, even if you're foreign, it says in the remark of the three matrices that again, they have only two real independent components or one complex, so I can still do the same thing. But since now this is a different formula, now we find that the tetrahedral project is given by a single formula in, as in the metric is now a phi of two. So there's phi of four instead of phi of two. So the, the ultra is really different. And that, that shows the four of the So it's really a uh, a different, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really different spin which you can describe. But it looks very similar. And once you realize that, then of course it's not difficult to generalize from the method to tetratic. All you do is you go through the same calculation, but I basically I keep adding two extra indices to my t. I have to q with two indices, I have a t with four indices, and then you do the same story. It almost go one to one over. But don't. But remember, since it's four indices under a spatial rotation, it will now transform with a, not with a, a, a factor two, but with a factor four. So the t again, it's not a scalar field; it's really a spin forward field. 
It's not, and it's also not a cube, it was a spin two field. So that you can find by the fact that it transforms different spatial rotations. And then this describes uh, a gap spin for connected nodes. And, uh, and this was also uh, discussed in this paper where people also did the numerical calculations and they called some of also magnetic rotons, these, these high spin nodes. So there are clear evidences. Uh, as far as I know, they have not been observed experimentally, but people, uh, it's not impossible to hear. I don't know how difficult it is, but. Uh, uh, they, they, they have some efforts, but I, I don't think it, it's, it's no, yet done. But, uh, no, no, but yeah. it's all numerically simulation suggests that. And so that's the way you go from the flexible quantum on side to high spins. And now uh, we can also do the quantum field theory because the only thing I would do is I would replace then by a two index symmetric tensor by a four index symmetric tensor. And then it, uh, well, transforms again and translates some more symmetries. And, but now the decompose are much more components, and all those again is a pure time component, one, and then there's a number of uh, components increasing the spatial incest. They all describe two elicity states, and then this is S, uh, this also is two. The, the two is really, I should say, of, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, they, these are really the, 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 two, the two elicity states of, of the massive modes. Uh, the massive Spin in three is like a mass lust spin in four, it's the same little group, and there's also two elicity states, and this, that is this two. And so again, if you take C to infinity, then these guys decouple, and what you're left is the S, A, B, C, D. And again, you can couple it in a complex field. And again, as I said, in the spatial rotation, it goes in X factors, spin four, and then you end up with the Schroeder equation for an, uh, uh, well, you should end up with the Schroeder equation for a spin four field. Um, and well, sorry, I still should do, of course, also the Barton trick, but that doesn't change much. I, 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 there's not, not much changes here. You do it, and you, again, you have a new Brown's here, E0. And then also, the, 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 my discussion of the continuous first discrete symmetries, that doesn't change. That's really the, the uh, that's really a series for the spin two case. And you get at the end of the day, you get a this and play the spin four show the function. So the spin four only shows from the fact that T transforms differently in the spatial rotation. And, I must say in this talk, I only discuss this at the level of the transformation rules. That is sufficient, but in the paper you are writing, we also do it. Well, you can do it at the level of the field equations, including all the circulations. In the paper you are writing, we also do it off shell, including the Lagrangian. And then there are extra the fields involved. It's a more complicated calculation. But at the end of the day, you, what happens is that all the details are washed out, and you always end up with an Schroeder Lagrangian if you do this, uh, if you do this calculation. And then uh, you can immediately make the jump also to uh, higher spins. Uh, <clears throat> and there is, in fact, a paper again in the Little Crystal literature by Joe McTone and Sarko Ruiz do that. They, have, they get a more and more complicated phases, it's called pianic phases. <coughs> and then it generalizes to for every p, there's an order parameter, which is now QA1 to AP. And they describe mass and motion spin two. It goes uh, literally uh, for every spin, you get the same story. And the same for the three-dimensional uh, quantum field theory, you have now an H with many indices. And, um, and, and but then if you if you uh, if, uh, if you then take the limits, you get again this, again all the subcomponents are washed out and are left with the Q, the same Q here, and you get the same Schroeder equation. So you get for every phase transition, for every P, you get now a Lagrangian describing a, a, a massive even spin, spin two, spin four, spin six, etc. The only thing I must say that I do not understand, and I, because I started my story uh, nicely with this simple principle, eh? uh, Eric preserved the morphisms, and it led to the GMP algebra, and to high spins, uh, all very nice. Now I have all the high spins. I, I, I can imagine you ask the question, where is now uh, the Eric preserved the morphisms? How is it realized? And this is something I do not yet understand, but this is after all working progress. But somehow I would believe that if you take all these spins together, then they should form a representation of this Eric Preserve and Deformism. It's one thing to say it, and another one to explicitly show how to do it. And that is not yet uh, in my uh, capacity. So, uh, but I, I really think that uh, it should work. But uh, I have to think, we have to think more about it. Now, uh, let us see. Um, it is 12 o'clock. I, I know one thing to make yourself very unpopular among the audience is to relentlessly go on with your talk uh, till you finish it and don't care about the time. But uh, uh, I don't most people. 
<laughs> what? And that's the story of most people you should carry on. I can carry on, but uh, we, we should maybe not overdo it. We are really interrupting with questions. What? We are relaxed, not a good time. Now. Shall I go on that for a while? But, but indicate if enough is enough. Is it's some order. Order. It should be some order. Otherwise, I, I don't like these things which go on and on and on and never stop. Because some people have other important things. We have two minutes to ask who teaching computers is the George. Five minutes is fine. Okay. How much? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Um, well, what I do is, uh, because uh, there are some topics I we could discuss, and let me just mention the topics which which are which are interesting, and then we can always discuss it informally. Shall I do that? That's, that seems good. So the point is that we have now this connection, and uh, but I myself worked a lot on three-dimensional mass and gravity, and now you see this connection. You wonder, can I use this expertise now to say something useful about the fractional quantum mole effect? So uh, it's tempting to use this connection now. To, to well, literally get cross fertilization. And I want to discuss, I should so also restrict my discussion to spin two, because that's one thing. Spin two is a nice connection with geometry. The highest spins is less clear how they are connected to geometry. And there are discussions about that, but that, that goes beyond, uh, beyond my uh, knowledge for the moment. So I will restrict to spin two. And then there are, it's interesting that, that there are, in both fields, you see that things are being done and that somehow they should be related. So one is that. Uh, what happens if you want to extend discussion into actions and high derivatives? So I told you in, in, in my case I start with the physical body mass mass term, but that's a very restricted thing because uh, that can lead to ghosts. If you if you keep adding if you keep adding interactions there, you have to be very careful not to induce ghosts. So we are highly restricted these interactions. The reason that you get ghosts is that because the kinetic term contains Lagrangian multipliers, killing ghosts. But if you add a mass term where the Lagrange multiplier occurs quadratically, then it becomes an auxiliary field, and then it doesn't kill the ghosts anymore. And in, in this in relativistic literature, there are two models where people introduce interactions. That one is the the round that is the model. They they in four dimensions they show how to generalize this master, and you can and in fact you can do it in three dimensions. And you can also make more simple. You can write also your science term. But another interesting way uh, is about which an interesting question is that what we did so time ago. That uh, we see the not, not nice thing about this master is on gauge invariant because it's just eight squared, it's on gauge invariant. But now there's a funny property in three dimensions and only three dimensions that is this property that if you have a subsidiary condition, and I first do it for a vector instead of h, if, if you have this condition, d nu, a nu is zero. So suppose I'm going to spin two and, 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 and the master for a, sorry, for a spin one, then this can be solved by saying that a nu. Is epsilon mu mu rho d mu uh, an other field, a rho. And that, that solves it, and not only solves it, but it's also the most general solution if you don't care about global things, because if this is zero, a is no solutions. So there is a kind of most general solution, <coughs> and that's also a thing here also. And that you can also do for, remember, I had this subsidiary condition, and that followed from the field's power, but you can solve it in terms of an Einstein tensor of another field, h. And now I do the trick in two times. So here you do the trick with one epsilon symbol, one index. Now I do it. And this is the the, the isotension three dimensions when I have two epsilon symbols. And if you substitute this back in the equations of motions and you integrate to an action, then what happens is that the mass term becomes, uh, you get a Lagrangian of this form. You get r squared plus r. So instead of, first you get r plus a mass term, a squared. And now the r becomes r squared, and the mass term becomes r. So you get a higher derivative Lagrangian. But that, that by, by definition, this thing, and that's what we call new mass of gravity, that thing describes a single uh, mass of a, a mass of spin to a mass. Okay, so it's an equivalent description, but now including interactions. And what is now interesting, you would do this at the linearized level quadratically. So I'm saying that there is an alternative to Fitz Pauli in which instead of kinetic term and mass term, you write a vector with four derivatives and a mass of two derivatives, and I know that that describes also a mass of speed two mode. And now you can take again the alternative limit, and then you should get a kind of alternative Schrodinger equation, where probably instead of one time derivative, you get two time derivatives, and instead of uh, two space, well, you get you get a high derivative Schrodinger you think that must exist and it must describe a mass of speed two mode. Does, it, does this require that the three dimensions are Euclidean? Say it again. Do you require that the three dimensions are Euclidean? No, 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 it is, it is impossible. We want to have additional poles floating around from the higher, from our squares. Uh, it's just, I do also, I have a condition, d nu a mu is zero, and I'm saying the solution of that locally, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not care about the local thing, is, is, is that. 
That is a, and it is not only a solution, it's the most general solution. But in the high, in the fact that it's higher to the ETF, yeah. just that it usually causes problems with Well, yeah, that's that of course the yeah, yeah. yeah. and it, it showed that, that at least in the little case, it again, it starts to master speed too much. But it's guaranteed because if I replace something by the most general solution at the level, it decreases motion. I don't change anything, I just give a different type of kind of thing, thing. and it indicates by nature. First, what it is also the high yields, you get problems, but it is if you don't have problems. So you can show that this R spec was R to describe a single master split to mode. You can, you can show that, yeah, that, and that's what we call new master plan. And this is just three dimensions. So it, it, it is, of course, dangerous, but we can it. So, for instance, this is not possibly four dimensions. If you write an R square to the R to the four dimensions, there are always uh, bad features that are so much paid by Stellar. But in three dimensions, you get the whole this. This is, in some sense, the analog of what's called topological mass of gravity. That's the, so I told you that you have Fritz Pauli and kind of square Fritz Pauli, the, the, the low limited. So it's topological mass of gravity that is the, the analog. This is really the, the it, it's, uh, well, it, it, it's there. But the point I want to make is that I know this type of mass in two modes. So if I take the limit, I know there must be some high limit of extension of shape also this type of mass in two modes. And I just like to see what it is because People sometimes ask, is it a unique way to describe the mass in two modes? That must be, because since the relativistic I know there's a second way to do it. At least at this level, there must also be in here a second way to do it. Must write at least a two way to check out. My, I, I would not be surprised if what you get is maybe sharing a square or so that you get or something like that. I don't know. But, uh, it would be interesting. That's, that's one thing. Then, um, the second thing is. Uh, that, uh, yeah, well, because if you do it relativistically, there's a really problem with uh, three dimensional gravity because you can never uh, make bulk and boundary nice. Because if in the bulk you want uh, gravitons with positive energy, and in the boundary you want a positive central charge. And somehow you can never have done both at the same time. But we wrote a paper where we could do it, but we had to use a trick. And the trick is that. Uh, we had to couple, uh, we had to write down, you see, usually if you write down the ice equations and you add a an, uh, an, an tensor, <coughs> then either this tensor is a mass tensor and it's conserved as the constant of decayed motions, or it is like the portion of the constant is conserved by itself. But there's another way where you can have this T where it satisfies the conservation condition, which means consistency, as a constant of the gravitational field curves itself. And that's but then it's highly unlikely that you can do that, but uh, we found that you can do it. Right? So, in other words, there is a way to write down the case of motions also in a, in a way which is not done before. And the, but the price you have to pay is that you only can write down the case of motions in terms of the mass. You cannot take the connection without any of the extra fields. So, uh, I'm just saying that, and that's all certain boundary terms. So, if everyone wants to think about boundary terms in the fresh cut wall, fact, it might be interesting to think about. This third way of writing down the cases of motion, but I, I, it's just a, a suggestion. I have nothing else to say. I'm just saying that there is an issue. There's really an issue relativistically with a reconciling bulk with boundary, and there's something to think about. And the third thing is, uh, yeah, a non-trivial topology. So that, that has been done. Papers have been written in the fraction called the Hall effect. Uh, and there are, it, it's a bit confusing. There are two geometries. Yeah, you have you have the master spin two geometry that describes the master spin two mode. And it fluctuates on the background geometry, that's the other geometry. And it was propagated by Halding that this mass split two geometry somehow should be uh, coming from a metric. And it would be interesting to see because I could write in my 3 by 3 notation, I could write G always, I took the linear in H, but I could I write exponent, and then to see whether again all the low terms of H get washed away, so that this in the non split because that supporting this thing with Halding, but that, 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 that I, I don't know what about that. But the other thing is that if you want to make See, one thing is that if you want to make this a mass with two geometry, you really um, have to take the limit in a different way, which I now took it. You see, when I went from Galilei to Barham, I did a funny trick with the phase transformation. I did a linear fish involved in the phase factor. But uh, in order, and that's really to, uh, in order to avoid infinities. But if you do it in a curve background, what you have to do is that, again, the sense of stability becomes important, but now you have to introduce a gate field for it. You really have to couple, if you want to take the limit for this thing, you have to couple this must be to not only um, uh, to, uh, to a, 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 a metric, but also to an extra gauge field uh, that, that in fact gauges this emergent you want. And the trick is then that if you relate it to a non field, you see a divergent term of stress of infinity. The point I want to make is that to 
you see, the only day I saw this is the one in the in the in the job team that I, I split my field into time, 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 space. But uh, in the in the flat case, I could, I didn't think about it. You did it, but in the curved case, you have to think. But what, who tells you what is time, what is space? And that's really the metric of this guy. So you have to introduce special via binder. You have to first to decompose your metric in this guy. So this guy is decomposed into different components. But to do that decomposition, you have to use the vier bytes of the background geometry, because they tell you what is time and space. And then you should see that you could, then you know what is the emergence you want, and then you should try to gauge to this MU. And if you can do that, then you can nicely, and then in lowest order, what you sh I'm sure you get is the, is the, uh, the Schroeder uh, Lagrange coupled to Newton Catan gravity. But the question is how, how you can do this at the, at the more, uh, at, at the more high level. It would be interesting to, to compare, because there is much work where people try to do this in the uh, in the in the in the Chrome of Sun, for instance, they they try to do this and they have all kinds of things, but for winters to compare with this way of doing it. And they in fact introduce even a bimetric field theory, because there's always an issue in Fitzpaul, you have the eighth field is one metric, but to write down the master, you need an item new. You need the second metric to write down the master. There's always two metrics involved. But you wrote down in theory in three dimensions, which we call try drive by there, it is necessary has two metrics. It will be interesting to see how to connect this to this biometric theory of Chrome of the Sun. But uh, again, I have not much to say about it. And then finally, one other thing to think about is uh, the supersymmetry. Uh, because in the high energy physics community, for years we, we hunt supersymmetry and we can't find it. It's not here. But in the fraction problem, all fact, there are also situations where supersymmetry do, do occur. And John also had a paper about it with uh, Patricio Sagrada de Boledo. And uh, uh, it will be interesting to see. Uh, of course, we wrote down many. Of these gravity theories in three supersymmetrically, so it would be interesting to see that if anything of what I said today could be done for the supersymmetric case. So, for instance, one thing is uh, a nice, uh, you could always give it to a master student, is that you take the Fitz Pauli and now you take the supersymmetric Fitz Pauli, which exists, and you take the limit, and then you should get somehow a fermionic partner of these order parameters. So, you get fermionic order parameters. So, that are order parameters that play all if you have also fermions, which get into a nematic or tetraptic mode. And it will be interesting to see, uh, I don't know whether in these situations do occur in liquid crystals, but it will be interesting to see what kind of order parameters are there, because they should be certainly uh, metric traces, but they should be more, should be more, you got a trace. I mean, it's interesting, well, this is something you can just work out and see what it is. It's, so there are nice things. One thing is that by connecting these two fields and see what people in different fields think about, there are nice projects to think about and to work out and to uh, produce more about it. So the, the, the nice thing of this work is that uh, it's nice to, uh, uh, to talk with people from different communities and uh, with John in particular, and you learn things and it's just an uh, enrichment of your research portfolio to do that. So I can recommend it to everybody to do that. That's all I have to say. And what about uh, Chan's lines gravity two dimensions? Yes. Well, Chan's lines gravity two dimensions. That's how two are gravity. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that, yeah, that, that, that's what I said. Um, you see, if you take gravity and you linearize it, that's what is found. If you take Chan's lines gravity, so top logical mass gravity. That's it. Then, uh, if you linearize, you get this uh, first order formulation of Chan's lines, which is called the Chan's lines. So, so and that breaks parity from the beginning. Yeah. So you, you could do that. Uh, so and that's an alternative thing. So you can either start from a fixed power, this is a limitation of gravity, and then do what that is. You can also start from, from topological mass of gravity, whose linear version is very fixed power, but that has already a parity problem. But the problem is that, is that uh, it just, since it's smaller, you can't combine two fields in a complex one. So the only way to do it, what I did, is to start from complex uh, topological mass of gravity. So complex is scary. And that's easy at the quadratic level, square fixed power, you can take complex, and that. We did it. You can get again a uh, 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 showing equation, but to do that at a modern level is not so easy. So, so they're not equivalent? Well, I, 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 uh, no, no, because, uh, 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 so new mass of gravity, uh, so that starts a mass of spin 2 of the both of these things, 2 of these plus or minus 1, the uh, topological is only 1 of these things, because there is a problem. That starts in the middle mode. Topological mass of gravity starts I plus or minus 2 modes. You must also, I, I, I started with 2 plus 2 minus, so it, it, it was broken by, by, the, by the limits, and then I left it one, because the GFD mode is so one mode, very much broken. And that was the break took place in the limits. In, in that case, you had to start with one mode, so you tried to get one mode. So, but at the end of the day, 
you don't get well, hey, you see the only thing you should get is the shirt on the page, there's nothing else like an alternative to the shirt. All these things should give you the same answer. But in practice, uh, this top logical mass is not so easy as I said, because you have to make you have to complexify it. It's, uh, it's uh, not easy to get interactions. So, so uh, that is nice to do at the quadratic level. I think here not so easy if you do that. That is if I I have more uh, uh, confidence in the in the real case. Where also this thing Halden said it's also a connection in the for real fields. Uh, that, 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 that this Q A B was uh, this this formula show. So I, I feel there are more possibilities to keep the thing open. But uh, never know. Is there some way of relating this to your to a gauge field for the diffeomorphism group and then some expansion of that gauge field to the diffeomorphism group? Uh, but the gauge field of the form is from just the net tensor. Well, there's, there's, there should be another way of doing it in somewhere, something like a term assignment statement or, or that, that diffeomorphism. Well, it is, it is, it is, it is, you mean uh, gauge is for every conservative. For every conservative. Well, that's what he that's did right. in this paper. Uh, uh, so, what he showed is we wrote down a natural science gauge here exactly as he wanted for the error conservative. Yeah. 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 So, you regulated the error conservative as SUN. Yeah, but the point that. So, that's very natural to go introduce a. No, there's no gauge field there. No, <laughs> but. We did that, what okay. you said. But the point is that. Then you have to use the gauge. You see, the gauge group has to be non compact. It's really, it's like Pantre or Lawrence. They say, yes, optimal effect of use. It's SO2,1. So you don't use SO3, but SO2,1. It's a non Euclidean version. If you do that, and then, so you get the kind of the, the error conserved of S, S1,1, I would call it play. Like, if you write down the true science gauge field, you get, you get exactly what Fredkin and Vasily did in the number of high spins in three dimensions. But that's not quite the same algebra as these ones. But, but what is interesting is what people show if you take that action and then you look to the abstract symmetries of that action, then you get, and that was shown by Hanno and Sorumay, then you get a non linear version of the GMP algebra, but not the GMP algebra. So the GMP algebra is really as a sub algebra SO3, not as a 2.1, it's, it's, it's a clean. So it's a different algebra. So it's, it's, so if you like, if you want to write down gates, you should have to use non algebra algebras and not, not algebraic algebra. So it's not quite the same thing. Right? It, it's, it's, it sounds the same if you write down, okay, observe uh, here, it's your science, looks very nice, but it's not quite the same. Uh, well, the science I use that you're flabbergasted and <laughs> hope that you can go for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I did.